Well, this past week, some of you may know, I had the opportunity to go and officiate at my sister's wedding. It's my little sister, Jamie. She's uh, nine years younger than me, and it was a real privilege to drive over to northern Wisconsin and do that. Uh, Actually, my brother flew in from Colorado, and uh, because of all the craziness in the world right now, the airlines messed up his flight, and instead of flying into Rhinelander, Wisconsin, which was 30 minutes from my parents' house, He flew into Minneapolis, and as I was driving from Bemidji to northern Wisconsin, I stopped by Minneapolis on my way (laughs) and and picked him up. So all total, I drove over 1,600 miles uh, in a seven-day stretch there. But it was great to be together with our family. We had a very small service. Um, As many people have had to do, change plans, they were planning on a wedding of 100-plus people, and there ended up being about 25 or 30 of us there It was an outdoor wedding. It was along a beautiful lake shore, a little tiny lake called Lake Robinson. Got a chance to go kayaking with my sister and and, uh, just hanging out around the fire, being with family uh, was really a blessing. One of the things I decided to do while I was in Wisconsin is go ahead and visit my grandmother, uh, my grandma Johnson. She lives in Appleton, which is about three and a half hours further than my parents. But I really wanted to see her. And so I went down, and she's at a care facility with her husband, Jim. And um, just really interesting to visit your grandma when you're not allowed to hug her. And my grandma's a hugger. But there I was with my brother, Robbie. We were standing outside the window for an hour having this conversation. And it was really a mix of emotions. It was a blessing to see her. And for my brother, all the way from Colorado, to see her. And so it was just, it was great. We talked with her, we prayed with her. But it was also really sad. It, it, was, it was a time where I just felt myself grieving because I saw my grandma and Jim in this little room and, and that's the, the extent of the life they have right now is this small space that they do everything in. And I felt blessed on, on the one hand that I got to drive off and do what I wanted to, but I just felt so badly for her. And it made me realize that there are probably many people in our church family who are grieving some of those things. A change in wedding plans or, or visits with family that had to be replanned or just aren't really what they're meant to be. And it, just, it made me pray for my grandma, but also pray for our church and our world as there are many people who are going through those kinds of struggles and those kinds of losses. As I was coming home from Wisconsin, I was trying to catch up on all kinds of emails and Facebook messages and all of that. And um, if you've contacted me and I haven't got back to you, I'm sorry. There were all kinds of things I'm trying to catch up on. Um, But one of those people I was excited to hear from was a friend that I haven't heard from in probably a year. This is a friend who moved out of state a couple of years ago and we've tried to stay in touch. So when I saw that he had messaged me, I was eager to read what he had sent. And this is a friend of mine who happens to be part of an ethnic minority. And I was wondering how he was doing with all the racial tension that's been going on in the last few weeks. I was really eager to hear from him and communicate with him and just try to encourage him. And again, it was a real mix of emotions as I read his message. Because as I read through what he was saying, I could just tell that he was hurting In fact, he was angry. And some of that anger was at white people. Some of that anger was at Anglos. And I don't know if he meant it to be directed at me, but that's how it felt. So even though he's a friend of mine, and I I consider him a friend, and I hope he still considers me a friend, it was such a difficult message to read and then try to respond to And and rather than being defensive or trying to explain anything that he was talking about, I just tried to let him know, I love you, friend. I'm grieving with you over all the racial tension, and I'm so sorry. These are hard times. Hard times to be in relationship and to know just how to to live for God and how how to keep some hope and some joy each day. I was excited to know that while I was gone in Wisconsin that we announced that our church is going to be reopening. 
And that really has been such an encouragement to me to know that we finally picked a date. After all this time, we have a Sunday picked out, June 28th, that we're able to get back together. Because I miss our church family. And I miss gathering here. And I know not everyone's going to come back right away, and that's totally okay. But I look forward to being here together June 28th. And I look forward to bringing a message from God's Word and having more than five or six people in the room gathered here on Sunday morning. And so I'm excited for that. Uh, I miss you. And um, we're going to get through this, but it's not always easy. Well, last week, Pastor Elvin kicked off our summer series on the Proverbs. If you didn't get a chance to listen to the message, you'll want to. It's a good sermon on trusting God, even when it's difficult. And it was a great sermon for me to listen to and be encouraged by as I was going through some of the things I just talked about. If you did miss that sermon, I urge you to go on our website and check it out later today. Today, we're going to take a look at Proverbs 1, 1 through 7. And as we do that, we're also going to do a bit of an overview of who wrote the Proverbs and how we can make the most of these Proverbs, how we can really get the maximum impact as we think about the wisdom that is contained in God's Word. I know I can't see most of you, but I want to ask you if you would raise your hand if you think we need wisdom in our world today. Yeah, all seven hands in the room just went up. And I hope in your living room or wherever you're watching on live stream that you would raise your hand and and agree, we desperately need wisdom today. In this time of COVID-19, all these unprecedented challenges, we need wisdom. In this time of incredible racial tension, not just locally or in our state, but around our nation, around the world, we need wisdom. We need discernment to know how to handle this. And even as we've been making plans to reopen the church building, we've prayed over and over for wisdom that God would guide us on how to reopen our church building and how to be safe and when to do that and how to navigate the disappointments that some people wanted to open sooner and some people think we're opening too soon. And we need wisdom. As we journey along on this quest for wisdom, there's something that we should make clear Our quest is not just academic. It's not just intellectual knowledge that we can learn and then master. Not at all. Our quest is for wisdom. Wisdom that is hard won. Wisdom that is gained over a lifetime of seeking God. Now, to be sure, wisdom does include right thinking, but it also includes right behavior. It includes finding God's will and then obeying that will. So to put it another way, wisdom is for disciples only. Don't come to God's word and and look for wisdom if you're just kind of a little curious. Because wisdom is not for curiosity seekers or for passers-by who want to just kind of tip their dip their toes into the water. Wisdom is a high calling. It is a challenging calling. Becoming fully devoted followers of Jesus together means we need to find God's wisdom. It's a lifelong quest to know his will. So before we dive in, I would invite you to please bow and pray with me. Heavenly Father, we do need your wisdom not our own wisdom. As Pastor Elvin just preached last week, not according to our own understanding. Lord, we need your direction. So we pray as we come to your word again this morning that you would enlighten our understanding, give us eyes to see and ears to hear, give us hearts that are teachable. Lord, we plead with you for the particular wisdom we need in these challenging days. So please help us now, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as I was thinking about this series on the book of Proverbs, I wondered to myself, how well do we really know the book of Proverbs? 
If you're someone who has read much of the Bible, if you've been reading it for at least a couple of years or more, odds are you have read portions of Proverbs. In fact, odds are you've probably read the entire book of Proverbs. And for some of us, we have read through all 31 chapters of Proverbs many, many times. So that got me curious. If I were to read a list of wise sayings, some of which are in Proverbs, and some are from, say, Benjamin Franklin, would you be able to tell the difference? Would we know which ones are God's words and which ones are human words, which ones are wisdom of the world? So just for fun, let's find out just how well we know the book of Proverbs with a little game that I've put together for us this morning. We're going to play games in church with a purpose. Games called Bible or Benjamins. Now, when I read off these sayings, I'm going to have you vote, whether you're in the room here with me or wherever you are in your living room, and even if you're there alone or if you have a few people with you, I'm going to have you vote on whether you think it's the Bible or Benjamins. And here's how you're going to vote. If I read a wise saying and you think that's in the Bible, I want you to raise your right hand as though you're swearing on the Bible. This is biblical truth. That's how you'll vote for a Bible saying. But if you think it's a saying by Benjamin, I want you to do this, like doling out the Benjamins. If you don't know Benjamin Franklin's picture is on the $100 bill, and so just kind of pretend you're doling out the Benjamins if you think Benjamin said it. So think it's in the Bible, right hand. Think Benjamin wrote it, just go like this and look around the room, see what other people are doing, hold them accountable. We're going to do a few of these. Ready? You better be, because I can't hear you talking back to me. So I hope you're ready. A gentle tongue can break a bone. Is that God's word? Or is that Benjamin's word? Go ahead and vote. All kinds of pressure. That is from the Bible. Proverbs 25, 15. A gentle tongue can break a bone. Here's the next one. An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Is that in the Bible? Or is that one of Benjamin's? An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Well, that one's Benjamin's. Early to bed and early to rise makes a man healthy, wealthy, and wise. Is that in the Bible? Or is that... Benjamin Franklin's. Early to bed and early to rise makes a man healthy, wealthy, and wise. Benjamin Franklin said that. Number four, better a neighbor nearby than a relative far away. Better a neighbor nearby than a relative far away. Is that the Bible? Or is that one of Benjamin's? It's in the Bible. Proverbs 27.10 Diligence is the mother of good luck. Diligence is the mother of good luck. Bible or Benjamin? I'm seeing lots of this in the room. That's correct. That is Benjamin. Like vinegar poured on a wound is one who sings songs to a heavy heart. Boy, what an important piece of wisdom for us to think about in our world. So many people feeling wounded, hurting. That one's in the Bible. Proverbs 25, 20. The leech has two daughters. Give, give, they cry. The leech has two daughters. Give, give, they cry. That one's in the Bible. Proverbs 30, 15. He that lies down with dogs shall rise up with fleas. He that lies down with dogs shall rise up with fleas. Bible or Benjamin? Benjamin. Benjamin, and one of my favorites of his. Now, I wanted us to play this game for two reasons. Well, three. I wanted us to have some fun. <laughs> but two main reasons. I wanted to whet our appetite for our summer in Proverbs. There are so many important things in this book that we need to look at and think about. And some are very funny, and some are very serious. Proverbs twenty-two eighteen 18 reminds us, For it is pleasing when you keep them in your heart, and have all of them ready on your lips. In other words, it's good for us to memorize these Proverbs, but also to have them handy. Not just so that we can show off at the Bible or Benjamin's game, 
but so that we have them ready on our lips, ready to put into action daily in our lives. The second reason I wanted to play this game was to illustrate that few, if any of us, really know all the Proverbs perfectly. And that's okay. I don't know how I would have done on the quiz, except I got to make the quiz. And I realize that some of you probably got all eight of them correct, and you're feeling pretty proud of yourself. And that's great. It's good if we know God's word well. But if I had done more of these, maybe 20 or 30 of these, I'm guessing that none of us would have gotten every single one correctly. The fact is we've all got things to learn. We have something that we can learn from the Proverbs, and we're reminded of that from the the section of verses that Pastor Eric just read. Proverbs 1, 4, and 5 reminds us that the Proverbs are for giving prudence to those who are simple, knowledge and discretion to the young. Let the wise listen and add to their learning, and let the discerning get guidance. So whether we are simple or young or wise or discerning, there's something here for everyone. There's more to learn. In fact, the book of Proverbs was compiled for those who are teachable. We need to be teachable. So brothers and sisters in Christ, let's get ready to learn the Proverbs. Let's let them teach us. Let's be humble enough to admit that there's something here for us in this upper level class on wisdom, wisdom 401. Let's dig in and pay close attention so that we can receive the maximum benefit from God's word, that we can gain that wisdom and instruction that he has compiled for us. The purpose of Proverbs is spelled out for us at the very beginning of the book. Verse 2 says, for gaining wisdom and instruction. There's something to gain here something that God has to give us. This word wisdom is actually, it shows up over 40 times in the book of Proverbs. And lots of other words like wisdom show up as well. But the treasure hidden within the book of Proverbs is wisdom. Wisdom is the treasure. Filled with practical insight for godly living. Not just intellectual data or clever sound bites but wisdom, wisdom which includes skill for living, following God's design, avoiding the pitfalls in this life. Proverbs is a collection of wisdom and warnings. That's what we've called our summer series, wisdom and warnings, all collected in these 31 chapters. And I'd like to imagine the skill of a carpenter or a woodworker or really good craftsman and think of the the skill that he or she has in in conducting their trade this is the kind of skill that proverbs offers all of us skill for good and godly living brothers and sisters in christ as we are becoming fully devoted followers of jesus together we need to gain wisdom and instruction from the lord We need the wisdom of these Proverbs to help us succeed. So let's do that. The book of Proverbs was compiled for those who are teachable. Let's be teachable people. Proverbs 1.1 begins, the Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel. Solomon's a fascinating man. He lived a very interesting life. He was a king. His dad was a king. He was the son not only of King David, but of Bathsheba, probably an interesting mom to get to know. Solomon is the one that God chose to build this incredible temple in Jerusalem. But more specific to what we're learning this morning, Solomon was given this incredible wisdom. He was one of the wisest people to ever walk the face of the planet. 1 Kings 4 teaches us that God gave Solomon wisdom and very great insight and a breadth of understanding as measureless as the sand on the seashore. Solomon's wisdom was greater than wisdom of all the people of the East, greater than the wisdom found in Egypt. And then 1 Kings 4 tells us he spoke 3,000 proverbs. This one guy. 
Now, interestingly enough, the Holy Spirit did not preserve all 3,000 of these Proverbs in the Bible for us. Kind of interesting to think about. Now, we do have a good chunk of them, though, and we can assume that God preserved and protected and passed along the ones that he wanted us to have access to. The fact is, Solomon was not really the only contributor to the book of Proverbs. The book of Proverbs was compiled under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. The reason I'm using this word compiled is that the book actually has multiple authors, multiple contributors. And this is similar to what we learned last summer when we looked at the book of Psalms. And we recognize that King David wrote many of the Psalms, but he did not write all 150 of the Psalms. And in a similar way, Solomon did not write all 31 chapters of Proverbs. See, Proverbs is actually this huge collection of wise sayings that was compiled over time. So even though Psalm 1-1 begins by saying the Proverbs of Solomon, only about half of them were directly written by him. And even a quick skimming of the 31 chapters makes it clear that Solomon partnered with other wise people, people like Agur and, and King Lemuel and others. It says that right in the text. In other words, many of the Proverbs in the book of Proverbs are wise sayings that were collected over the years. And then those sayings were sifted and assimilated into a master collection that became the book of Proverbs as we know it today. And all of this happened under the guidance and the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. God was watching over the process the whole time. In other words, the 31 chapters of Proverbs are actually a grand compilation of seven different collections that were brought together under the canon of Scripture. Canon just means collection. So even as we consider this idea of multiple contributors to the book of Proverbs, it may cause us to ask the question, so what's the difference between the wise sayings inside the Bible and all of the wise sayings outside of the Bible? Throughout human history, many wise teachers, many elders have been blessed with common grace wisdom, and many of their wise sayings have been written down and recorded and passed along to us. frankly, much of that wisdom has been very beneficial to mankind. Much of that wisdom has benefited civilization as we know it. This actually resonates with a sermon from two weeks ago where we talked about submitting to authorities. We talked about this idea about how God provides this common grace wisdom to governing officials so that they can govern well. Even governing officials who aren't believers, who don't even know God or love God, Their ability to govern was given to them by God so that God could bless humanity in that way. But what makes the wisdom that we find in the book of Proverbs special? What makes it unique? Well, first of all, it's authoritative. (coughs) And that's due to the distinct nature of the fact that it is in the canon of Scripture. Every wise saying contained within the book of Proverbs is inspired by the Holy Spirit. They're a matter of decree and command. The Proverbs are not simply good advice that we can think about whether we want to take it or not. We're not supposed to kind of sort through it and consider, well, that's one possible option. I guess I'll think about it. These are God's words. And this is what Proverbs 1.3 is driving at. The book of Proverbs is for receiving instruction in prudent behavior doing what is right and just and fair. Therefore, in contrast to all the other wise sayings of Benjamin Franklin or whoever else it might be, the wise sayings in the book of Proverbs speak on God's authority. And that's what makes them distinct. It makes them special. Because God is the one who ultimately determines what is right and what is just and what is fair. We live in a day and age, though, where many have deemed truth to be relative, change based on a person's frame of reference. Put another way, one thing might be true for you, but it may not be true for me. But God's word speaks with authority, the authority of absolute truth. 
And the frame of reference for Proverbs is the Lord. The book of Proverbs is God's divine revelation. So certain things are always wrong. And certain things are always right. Why is that? Because God says so. Because he determines what is right and just and fair because he is divine. He is the Lord. Well, the second thing that makes these Proverbs special is that they guide us toward godly living. Not just toward wisdom or or productivity or something like that, but they guide us toward godliness, being like God, being the way God wants us to be. So these are not just wise sayings with a pragmatic benefit of making our lives better or contributing to our health and happiness. They may indeed do all of that, but the wisdom in Proverbs is directly related to the glory of God, to the goodness of God. And that makes them distinct. In other words, God is glorified when we live according to the specific wisdom that he has revealed in the book of Proverbs. One Bible commentator named Derek Kidner says it this way. (coughs) The one Lord makes known his will and thereby a single standard of what is wise and right. So a sense of purpose and calling lifts the teaching of Proverbs above the pursuit of success or tranquility, clear of the confines, clear of the confines of a dry moralism into the realm of knowing the living God in all one's ways. So the book of Proverbs was compiled under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And this leads us right into our final point for today. It's vital that we recognize an assumption that the book of Proverbs is making. The book of Proverbs was compiled with a prerequisite, the fear of the Lord. Verse 7 makes it clear, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The fear of the Lord can be defined as a loving reverence for God that includes submission to his lordship and to the commands of his word. And reverence means respect. But it also means fear. It means that we should stand before the Lord, the Almighty God, and tremble at His greatness, at His majesty. Reverence for God, fearing the Lord, is a prerequisite for this 400 level course on wisdom. And if you have not met that prerequisite, then you shouldn't take this class. You shouldn't take this course in the book of Proverbs until you begin first with that prerequisite. Now, let's not misunderstand the the word beginning here. Beginning does not refer to this initial step that we take and then leave behind us. Beginning actually refers to fearing the Lord as the first controlling principle. It is a long-lasting, awestruck reverence for God. And it continues on, not just at the beginning, but it continues forward, this ongoing reverence for God. In fact, I would argue that that reverence even deepens as we get to know him better. But not everyone fears the Lord. And verse 7 talks about that. It goes on to describe the other choice. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. Without a healthy dose of the fear of the Lord, we will never gain the wisdom and instruction that we need for this life. In fact, we can't even begin to start to gather some of the knowledge and wisdom that we need to enjoy what God has for us in this life, to be the people he's called us to be. So if you're in the sanctuary this morning, or if you're listening via live stream, or if you're listening to this recording later, and you don't fear the Lord, if you don't tremble before his awesome power and might, then don't bother with the Proverbs. Don't waste your time on the Proverbs, because they're not for curiosity seekers. 
And don't waste God's time. God is looking for devoted followers, people who reverence him, who understand the power of his word. As we wrap up this opening text on wisdom, let's conclude with one important question. How do we get wisdom? Even as I preach this message this morning, my prayer as we look at Proverbs is that all of us will desire God's wisdom, that we'll come away wanting God's wisdom, wanting more of it. But how do we actually get it? How do we attain wisdom? Here's some good news. Wisdom is available for anyone who wants it. In fact, it's, it's almost a little bit offensive the way it says it, but the opening seven verses of Proverbs makes it clear that even fools, even simpletons are invited to come and learn wisdom. So as we ask this question, how do we get wisdom, let's consider an answer that we find in Proverbs 2. Proverbs 2 says that we get wisdom in at least two ways. First of all, wisdom comes from God alone. Proverbs 2.6 says, for the Lord gives wisdom, from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. So if we sincerely want to get wisdom, we need to ask God for it. He alone is the source of true wisdom. We can't drum it up on our own effort. We can't study our way into it and develop our own intellect to become smart enough to be wise. That's not what this is talking about. In fact, James 1, 5, and 6 says that if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. In other words, in order to get wisdom, we need to get faith first. We need to believe in God first. Proverbs 2 also suggests a second way to get wisdom. Wisdom comes by diligently seeking. Proverbs 2, 4, and 5 says, And if you look for it as for silver, search for it as for hidden treasure, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. So if we sincerely want to get wisdom, we should diligently seek after it. We should put some energy into it because God wants to reveal his wisdom for us today. That's the reason the book of Proverbs was recorded and translated and handed down so that we could have access to it today. But are we genuinely seeking God's wisdom? Do we want it? Will we do what it takes to get it? If we truly desire to attain God's wisdom, it begins with the fear of the Lord. Without the fear of God in us, these Proverbs won't really help. They won't really penetrate into our hearts and minds. They won't really guide us as they're intended to. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. So what do you say? Will you despise God's wisdom and instruction? Or will you fear the Lord? Will you get the wisdom that you need for this life? The way of wisdom, the beginning of knowledge, is the fear of the Lord. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful that you offer us wisdom Because there are so many times that we have been foolish. And there are so many times where we felt like a deer trapped in the headlights where we just, we don't know what to do. We don't know what to say. And we need wisdom in those moments. And so we pray, Lord, that you would help us to be teachable. Teach us to have an appropriate fear and reverence for you. And may this lead us to your wisdom. And may this wisdom not only help us, not only help us to help others, but Lord, may it bring you great glory. And so we ask for your wisdom. We ask this together in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen.